What's up everybody, it's Matt from TDM Style here. Welcome back to the channel once again, and welcome to a video that I've been wanting to make for a long time. Um, and also I was lazy this weekend and didn't feel like filming all kinds of different, like B-roll and hair footage, honesty. So today I want to talk about the differences and pros and cons of both lab made slash salon products and homebrew products. Now I'll preface this video by saying this is not meant to be like a hot take and I'm not going to be throwing shade at, well, I mean, there might be some shade and spicy bits kind of sprinkled throughout the video, but, but I'm not, I'm not doing this to take a side of one or the other. Um, I just want to present you guys with some, some quality information on both types of products. And because I feel like there is a lot of misinformation out there, or, or at least misconceptions um, about both. So if you are new here and you're brand new to exploring the world of hair products, a super, super quick and dirty rundown of what the hell I'm even talking about, uh, lab made slash salon products are exactly that, products that are mass produced in professional laboratories uh, and things that you can find, you know, not only on the shelf at your uh, barbershop or, or hairstylist, uh, shop, um, but you know, also you'll find them in, in stores everywhere, Ulta and Sally's and drug stores and all kinds of places. And on the other side, home brews are called that for a reason. They are brewed mostly at people's homes. These are small business, you know, entrepreneur people who are usually not professional chemists and they just decided to pick it up uh, and they've you know created their own formulas for products at home or some of them you know the larger companies like flagship and lockhart's actually now have like warehouse facilities where they brew larger batches and stuff uh, but anyway the point is they're not made in labs um, they're made at homes so in in the the world of you know pomade collecting and like hair styling groups out there and stuff there, to me, there seems to be, there often seems to be a bit of a divide where there are, you know, some people who are like, oh, homebrew only, lab products are all terrible and they're bad for you and they're bad for your hair and blah, blah, blah. And there are also some other people who are always into lab products and don't like homebrews for one reason or another. And, you know, so that's why I'm here to talk about both and then y'all can decide for yourselves what you want to use. So I figure we will start with uh, pros and cons of each one. And then after that, we can just talk about some, you know, common misconceptions or potential misinformation that you may have heard or you may run into. <sighs> oh my God. So let's start with lab made products first. Now in the list of pros, number one, these are formulas designed and produced by professional chemists. So that means these are people who went to school and studied science and chemistry. And so they have a, an intricate knowledge of all of the ingredients that they're using. And so they'll know, uh, you know, if a brand says, hey, I want this type of product, the lab people are gonna know, okay, well then let's put these ingredients together and here's your formula. Now these are also made in clean rooms and most of them have some pretty strict clean room requirements. Like if you're going to a lab to check out the products being made, you have to wear a hairnet and probably a mask and gloves. And it's, you know, it's, it's very locked down. Now, part of that comes down to the fact that they are FDA regulated. I mean, like most other cosmetics, you know, makeup, skincare products, and those sort of things, they are FDA regulated. And that means that there are strict uh, requirements, not only for, you know, amounts of specific ingredients that they can or cannot use, uh, but also for, you know, mandated, like, cleanliness of production environments and that sort of thing. So what does that oil, oil? What does that all boil down to? Well, you're going to get consistency from batch to batch. So what I mean like that, it, what I mean like that, Jesus, words are hard right now. What I mean by that is, um, you know, if you buy, let's say we're talking about a, a hair clay. Uh, if you buy one from a batch made this month, and then six months later, you buy another one from the same brand from obviously a very different batch, chances are pretty damn good that the product inside that jar is going to look 
and smell and perform exactly the same as the first one did. You know, and that's due to the things I mentioned before and generally also because there is a high level of quality control. So the last one, which is a, a pro, but also kind of leads us in a, in a way into the con section. Um, so there are multiple tiers of lab-made products. There are, you know, the drugstore or very budget-friendly products out there, uh, which are just cheap anywhere from, you know, say one to five bucks. There is the kind of middle ground, which are, you know, say 10 to $15. And then there are the high quality salon brands. So these are the ones that, you know, maybe you won't find them in Target or CVS or whatever. You'll find them, like you have to buy them from the salon or you have to ask your hairstylist to buy them from their um, like professional hair product store where they go buy their shit. And you know, those are typically much more expensive, say anywhere from 20 to, I don't know, what was that what Was that one that I used? It was like $80. Those are the highest priced ones. Um, so I think where that can be a pro is that it's pretty easy to know what you're getting in a way, because at least in my personal experience, lab made products are very often a you get what you pay for type of situation. So if you're buying a $3 pomade, it's probably not going to be as good as a $25 pomade. So and that is kind of a con as well, because in, in a sense, um, yeah, so like you get what you pay for and you know if you're, generally speaking, if you're buying an expensive product, it's probably going to be pretty good. Uh, but first of all, that's not always the case. There are definitely some pricey products that are very mediocre. Like this one, you remember that video? What the fuck happened to Avita growing clay? Or, or this one, let's get the joke out of the way. Ooh. But yeah, so you know, it can also be a con because sometimes you just, you can't afford a $40 hair product and that's totally understandable. <laughs> Another con is that there are definitely some real dumpster fire formulas out there. And, and sometimes, I mean, there's so many products and so many brands out there um, that sometimes you just, the only way you're gonna find out, uh, if you haven't seen a review from, from me yet, <clears throat> um, is by trial and error. So you might get stuck buying a product that, that turns out to be trash. I mean, just look like, look at the head and shoulders garbage that we used a couple of weeks ago. And I'm gonna put that video up there because if you haven't watched that yet, you should watch it because it's informative and funny. There's also some shady business going on. So, and I mean, that's, you know, and that's like a huge company. That's Procter & Gamble. I mean, they make tons of shit. They're enormous. They have money out the wazoo. Um, so I feel like they definitely could spend the money to make good formulas, uh, but they, I guess, just don't want to or, or, or don't care probably. And the other potential con of lab products, I mean, this is less so from a consumer standpoint, this is more like, you know, if you're a small business and you're looking to get products made for you, um, a lot of the, you know, the good laboratories and stuff require pretty large purchases. So in other words, if you go to a lab company X and you say, hey, I want to make a hair clay, um, they might very well say to you, okay, well, our minimum purchase is 5,000 units or 10,000 units or, you know, something. Um, and so that's part of where the higher cost of salon quality lab products come from is because generally speaking, a lot of time, not only are the quality of ingredients expensive, but you're also paying for, you know, the the salaries of the chemists and other people who work in the lab, but you're also, I mean, that the company that's, start, or the person who's, you know, gonna be selling you these products has to buy a shitload of them in the first place, so they gotta make their money back, you know? <laughs> okay, so with that, let's move into the homebrew side of things now. So some of the pros here, um, I would say first and foremost, generally speaking, you tend to get more product for a lower cost, so, you know, for by way of an example, if you're spending 20 bucks on a pomade, for a Salon One, you might get a two ounce jar. Whereas a homebrew, you might spend even less than that, maybe it'll be, you know, 15 or 16 dollars, 
and you'll probably get four ounces of product. Another is that you're supporting small businesses. Now I'm a big fan of buying, you know, local and supporting small businesses because I, you know, I have people in my family who, who run their own business and I know that it's difficult and it's stressful. And, you know, so if, if you have an opportunity to spend some money for those kind of folks, instead of giving it to a large shitty corporation that sells bad hair products, um, you know, I think that's a good thing. Now that's not to say that that lab made products can't be small businesses either. I mean, look at like Steven the Salon Guy or Brad Mondo from X Mondo. I mean, they're getting high quality shit from, you know, professional salon laboratories, but those are small businesses, you know, they're not giant companies. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Back to the pros of Humbers. Uh, another pro that I would say is that there are a lot of really unique products out there. I mean, you'll find shit coming out of homebrews that you'll never see come out of a lab. I mean, there's just, it's just the nature of people experimenting with various ingredients and formulas at home, and they might just stumble upon something and that like turns out to be amazing. And that leads us directly into our next pro is that, you know, you can get some really fucking great products from homebrews. There are some things that are work super well. And um, because of their potential uniqueness, um, it's also a, a big collector thing. I feel like there's much more of a collector's market for homebrew products than there is or ever will be for, for lab-made ones. Um, and you know, so I, sometimes I have, I have a bit of a collector in, that was a weird, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, I have a bit of collector in me. Like I used to play magic, so I had those cards for a while. And like, there's, there's something that can be joyous about collecting unique things. Um, so I definitely understand why there's like a huge, that's like a huge part of the homebrew market, I feel, are people who just like to collect. And so they have like a million different pomades and stuff. So now we can start moving into the cons. Now this one, this is another one of those that I think is, it can be both a pro and a con. And that is um, that oftentimes a lot of homebrews will do limited runs of stuff or seasonal batches. Now I, I like the seasonal thing kind of because that, that can make sense, you know, because as a, depending on which season it is outside, um, you're probably going to be using a different type of product, you know, to, to combat the whatever weather you might be having at that time of year. So I think seasonal releases can definitely make sense as long as they come back around every year. Um, but with the limited batches, now I get that that's, that can be a pro for the collectors because then you could say like, oh, look at this, I have this pomade that was made once five years ago and they never made it again, but it was awesome. And there was only 50 jars of it made, you know, whatever. Um, but by the same token, I definitely think that that can be a con because what if you're in that situation, you found this product and you love it and it works amazing for you. Um, and then the company's like, well, it was a limited release and it's all gone and we're never going to make it again. Or, or we'll make it again, like in a year or something, you know? And then, so then you're just, you're stuck like without it for the rest until they release it again. Like that can be a major bummer. Uh, other cons, I would say, well, this is a con for both lab and homebrew, which I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but the, it's a seriously saturated market. I mean, there are so many brands now. So sometimes it can be tricky or difficult. Like if you're looking to buy something, it's like, where, what do I get? Where do I go? There's so much to choose from. Other cons um, for homebrews, they're, they're not made by pro chemists, usually. I mean, I, could be, I'm not trying to ruffle anybody's feathers. You know, I, I definitely, uh, I enjoy a good homebrew. Um, but you know, I, I, from my experience, I would say that, you know, more often than not, the people who run homebrew businesses are, are not professional chemists. And that's not like a dig at them. It's just, it's a fact. So as a result, they, there's a lot of experimentation that goes on. And so that's why a lot of times with homebrews, you'll see a, maybe one product will come out and then they'll reformulate it like five times. But, you know, I guess it's just kind of the nature of the beast when you're not like scientifically precisely knowing exactly what ingredients and what proportions of them to put in a formula and you're just basically experimenting. Uh, it's just, it's what's going to happen. Now, with that being said, I mean, in my experience, like any brewer that I've ever dealt with 
is usually super nice and very like they welcome reviews and criticism of their product performance and so or a lot of times like if you get one and there's something wrong with the formula like it's not it doesn't look the way it's supposed to or it doesn't do you know i would say nine and a half times out of ten you contact that brewer and they're gonna just say oh my bad dude i'll send you out another one you know so it, it's it's a balanced thing, I guess. And kind of related to that is that homebrew products are not FDA regulated right now. So they're, it, in a sense, that means that they can kind of do whatever the fuck they want. Um, now, obviously, they're not that I'm aware of. I don't think there are any homebrewers out there who are just like, hey, 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 put this terrible stuff in here. Nobody's gonna know about it. You know, people aren't, they're not out to get you. Like, that's not what I'm saying. It's just another thing, you know, like, they're so they're not required to be made in a clean room and they don't have they're not being regulated in terms of what ingredients and proportions are in products. And a lot of times, you know, some, like I said earlier, some homebrew companies have big facilities now, like warehouses and they obviously, and they're cleanly, they, they wear gloves and masks and whatever. Um, but it's just that they're not technically required to do any of that. So, and another shared con uh, of homebrews and lab products, there are some really fucking bad formulas out there. I mean, that's, that's just, you're going to find that regardless of who's making what. There's just, there's some stuff out there that's great, and there's some stuff out there that's fucking terrible. <laughs> All right, now I want to talk about some common misconceptions that I think are out there. So the first one I want to mention is there seems to be this, um, how do I put this tactfully? There seems to be a school of thought out there uh, that only homebrew products made with 100% natural ingredients are like okay for you to use. And if you're using lab products that have, you know, various other chemicals in them, that it's bad and it's gonna make your hair fall out or it's gonna make you, I, I don't know, grow a third eyeball somewhere. I don't know. I so that's just you're wrong. I mean, it's it's just not factual. Like, I, just because a product might have some chemicals in it that aren't 100% natural or they're, you know, man-made or whatever, that doesn't automatically mean that they're bad for you. There are there are reasons why lab-made products have certain ingredients like that in there. Usually, you know, for it, it goes it comes back to a consistency thing, whether it's consistency for, you know, the the texture of the formula itself like emulsifiers and other things or consistency across batches or you know whatever they're like stabilizers and and preservatives so that they don't go bad in in three weeks you know so there's stuff that yeah it might be have a complicated looking name that you can't pronounce right away um but oftentimes if you look up those ingredients they're fine now that's not to say that there aren't lab made products that do have shitty ingredients in them. I mean, like, you know, if you buy $3 Head & Shoulders shampoo that's full of sulfates, yeah, it's probably gonna make your hair dry, but I, it's not gonna make you go bald or give you hair cancer, I don't know. Um, so the next one, it was kind of on the same platform as that. There is another uh, school of thought. I don't know why that's like the phrase that I'm defaulting to, um, that Homebrew products are good and lab-made products are bad, like in terms of performance. Also false. I mean, I mean, there there are definitely are bad lab products. I mean, again, Head and Shoulders, Axe products. But if you do the research or or just ask your stylist and you buy like a high-quality salon-grade product, that's just gonna be off the fucking chain. And by the same token, uh, there are plenty of homebrew products that are also just tits. Uh, but there are also homebrew products that are garbage. So it, it's both sides have good products and bad products. Uh, so there's also one that is definitely from the, the homebrew market and that is that like products with a hard top layer or like clumpiness is like a normal thing that you should expect. I, I, might, I might get a little fire for this. I don't know. I don't, I don't think that that should be like a normal expectation. I mean, granted, like it just is sometimes. Like with homebrews, that's just, it just happens. Whatever, whatever goes on in that formula, you know, sometimes, yeah, you're gonna have a hard top layer. Or you might have like clumpy bits of wax in there. Um, but do I think that should be happening? I ideally, no. I mean, I, th I think that it's a, a goal uh, to not have that happen. I just, th that's why I think it's a misconception that there are some people that think like, well, every hair product 
should have a hard top layer and might be have to break it down for a while. Like, well, no, if you have a consistent formula that's on lock, you're not going to have those things happening. Um, and there's also another one that I've been seeing, I don't know. So there's this weird, I think it's weird <laughs> idea that like if you if you like products that are soft and easy to scoop and easy to apply that you're that like your dick is small or, or like you have your what do they call them frail finger boy i've seen that that term thrown around um because there are a lot of products out there usually homebrew products like oil-based pomades and things that are thick and like hard like you need like back of the thumbnail or like a one of those like mini melon ballers that's collecting dust in your kitchen like maybe this will be like a good use for it to like get the pomade out and there are some people that are like oh well if you if you don't like hard products and you're you can't be bothered using those and you're a you little bitch like i don't <laughs> i don't agree with that i'm sorry i just don't like i when I'm styling my hair in the morning, I don't want to have to like fucking heat it up with a blow dryer for five minutes just so that I can scoop it out and like actually use the goddamn thing. Like, it, would I choose that or would I choose a product that, that's like soft and I can easily just go whoop, bam, and put it in and like if it performs well, uh, I'm gonna go with the fucking soft one. Um, obviously that's, that's a very opinionated thing and I'm sure some of it is just people just bullshit trolling just to be funny, which is fine. Um, but I'm sure there are also people out there who do really actually think that, which is just, it's just weird to me. It's just an odd, it's an odd thought to have. I don't know. So, uh, final thoughts and a couple other considerations. There's also this whole genre of white label products that are out there. I feel like that's a whole other video in itself, but I did want to just kind of mention them. Um, and in case you've maybe heard the term floated around and you weren't sure what it meant. Um, essentially, there's a huge market out there where as a person, you can go to a company um, that just makes like generic hair products and you can buy those and slap your label on it and resell it, uh, which is what Pete and Pedro does. Um, so that's white label. I mean, like they're called white label, I guess, cause that means like it's a blank blank label and you put your name on it and you're like, yeah, it's, it's mine now. It, now, I, I don't know. I want to say that I don't think that there's anything like inherently wrong with that. I mean, cause if you, you know, that that's basically like going to a lab and saying like, hey, make a product for me. Um, but the difference is that if you're going to a lab and spending the money, you get you get a unique formula that's like only yours. Whereas white label, you could have five different brands like Pete and Pedro and Mr. Pompadour um, that sell products with different names on them, but they're exactly the same product. Now, does that mean the product itself is bad? No, it could be really good. I don't know, but it's just, it's annoying to me that like I could go and buy this product and then buy one from over there and I get it and I'm like, what the fuck? This is the same thing as the other one I just bought. You know, um, so it's just more of a annoyance thing, I guess. Or I, like sometimes I feel like it's disingenuous because they don't, if they're not telling you that their product's white label and they're like, no, it's totally unique. It's definitely not, nobody else, nobody else has this. Uh, and if they're clearly just lying to your face, with me, that's an issue. Yeah, so that wraps things up for today. I hope that you guys found this video informative and helpful um, and maybe a little funny. Now, things that are coming up. First of all, uh, I'm gonna be doing some more Demon Souls streaming later today on the Kaelin King. King. King channel. Um, so actually, probably I'm probably live right now by the time this video goes up. So come on over, sub to Kaelin King, because I'm almost at 100 subs, getting, we're, professional gaming. Um, so come on by, hang out for a bit. We'll have a good time. Also, check out this fucking sexy PR package I got from X Mondo. We have their entire new color lineup, super pink, super purple, and super blue. So I'm super excited. A lot of supers going on. I'm real excited to use those. Um, I have an appointment with my stylist next week. And so we're going to be using one of those. And I'm going to have a video on that. So really looking forward to that. So please stay tuned for it. If you haven't already, feel free to hit the sub button down below to keep up to date with everything. And as always, thank you guys so much for coming by and watching. And we'll see you at the next one.